everyone. My name is Kate Schutzengel, and I am a researcher on the subscriptions and invoicing team at Stripe. And today I'm joining you from Brooklyn, New York. Hi everyone, I'm Azalea Irani and I'm joining you from the Bay Area. I'm a researcher on the developer and integration experience team at Stripe. Hi, I'm Yi Yi, joining you from Denver, Colorado today. Like Azalea and Kate, I'm also a researcher from Stripe in the broader design team. Many of you are already familiar how powerful Figma is as a design tool, but we're here today to talk to you about how you can also leverage it to uplevel your user research to be more structured and engaging. As Yi mentioned, we're part of the broader design team at Stripe, which is now over 200 people across all disciplines of UX. Stripe describes itself as building financial infrastructure for internet businesses. And it sounds complicated, but it means that among many things, we built tools that allow business owners to easily and compliantly accept payments from their customers. Stripe manages over half a trillion dollars of processing volume annually. So while you may or may not have heard of Stripe, there's a pretty good chance you've interacted with it, especially for the Americans here. Over 80% of American adults have made a purchase on Stripe in the past year. We operate globally, so our products and services are available to businesses in 47 countries worldwide. And those businesses can accept credit card payments from customers in 195 countries. Stripe's user base is business owners and the people who work at those companies. Our users range from large companies with thousands of employees, like some of the companies pictured on the left, all the way down to small businesses and solopreneurs. Today, we're gonna to talk about a fictional user, Beth, who owns a magic woodwork shop. She has a small business handcrafting chessboards. We know that when you're running a small business, every dollar and every minute counts. So our goal at Stripe is to decrease the time it takes for a user to accept their first payment on Stripe. Today, we're gonna to walk you through what the research process may look like from conception to launch for a product at Stripe called Payment Links. And the idea behind Payment Links is that you don't need a website or a storefront for your customers to interact with. Our users can generate a link for a product and share that out with their customers, however they're already communicating with them, whether that be email, WhatsApp, text message, or anything else. The customer uses that link to go directly to the checkout screen for that specific item and can easily and securely pay with their credit card or a different payment method. In the next few sections, we'll walk you through an illustrative research process of how we get from the idea of decrease the time it takes for a user like Beth to accept their first payment to payment links as a product and how FigJam helps us elevate our research along the way. This is an oversimplification of the research process, but we do generally think about it in these three phases, identify an opportunity, develop concepts, and evaluate solutions. First, I'm gonna to talk to you about how we identify an opportunity. We have our goal to decrease the time taken, but at this point, we don't know exactly how to accomplish it. We need to figure out what the opportunity is for Stripe and for our users. And to do that, we need to understand what people are doing today. What are their goals? What's most important to them? What are their current workflows and processes? And how can Stripe fit into what they're already doing to improve it? And where are the pain points? What's challenging or difficult or frustrating for them so that we know where the opportune places to ideate and grow are? Now, to answer these questions, we're going to use FigJam for an interactive workflow mapping session to find themes across users. So we're going to jump to a live demo now. Um, Azalea is going to play the part of Beth, my small business owner today, and she sells handcrafted one-of-a-kind chessboards. Azalea, are you ready to become Beth? I'm ready. All right. So Beth, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I wanna to talk to you about how you get your orders and have your customers pay you. So tell me, when you have a new chessboard to sell, what is your first step? So I have a pretty big Instagram following. So I usually post a picture there when I have something new to sell. Um, I love it because that's where all my customers are anyway. Mm -hmm. And then what happens next? Uh, so people DM me that they want to buy it, um, and then I have to make sure that I still have the one that they want in stock. Okay. And how is that set for you? Um, it's kind of annoying. I try to do first come first serve usually, but it's a pain to make sure I don't accidentally sell one chessboard twice. Yeah, I can see that being kind of frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, and what usually happens after this? Uh, they give me their shipping address, 
which I have to usually write down somewhere. Uh, I calculate the shipping cost, tell them the total, and then I give them my Venmo or PayPal to send money to. Okay, got it. Um, and then what's the next step after that? Well, once they pay, um, I box it up and then ship it out to them. Okay. And is that the last step of the process for you typically? Yes. Okay. So let's zoom out a little bit and take a look at the whole process that we have here. Now that we're looking at it all together, is there anything missing? Any steps that we didn't already talk about? Hmm. Actually, I do have to match up who paid on Venmo with the message uh, in Instagram to make sure they actually paid me. So I'm shipping it to the right person. It's, it's, it's super annoying because people's names on Instagram don't match their names on Venmo. Uh, I really wish I could just send them a link to the chessboard directly, but it's really not worth, um, worth it to build out a website just because they sell out so quickly. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much, Beth. You can now go back to being Azalea. And we are going to talk about why FigJam for this. So hopefully that gave you a sense of what it might look like to actually run a research session doing workflow mapping in FigJam. In the past, I've had people just tell me what they do and I take notes separately. But there's something about my participants seeing it all visually listed out that really helps identify missing steps along the way. We can also use stamps to annotate parts of the process. So you saw Yi was taking notes there. Sometimes I'll take notes myself and do it. Sometimes I'll have the participant write it in, but we can uh, add things that are thumbs up for things that work well, thumbs down for things that work poorly or for ideas that we might have along the way. And then the Fig Jam itself creates a really engaging deliverable and illustrates the sometimes very complicated processes that our users have to go through much more vividly and clearly than a paragraph or a bulleted list could ever do. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Azalea to talk about the next step of the research journey. Great, so we wanna make sure that people who have businesses like Beth are aware of new features like payment links and feel confident in their choice of Stripe products for their businesses. In order to design for that, we wanna answer three research questions. What information do people need to be able to select a Stripe product? What do they need in order to feel confident about their choice? And how would they ideally like to learn about the different choices available to them? So to answer these questions, we use FigJam to conduct two participatory design exercises, one focused on the Stripe dashboard and one focused on our documentation. We did this because our users use both our technical documentation as well as our dashboard to learn about Stripe products when they first get started. Uh, so let's start with the one that was focused on the dashboard experience. So in this fictional example for users like Beth, we wanted to make sure that they have the information they would need the most to, uh, to make decisions that they uh, about Stripe products. So we presented them with a dashboard page where they could pull in existing information that was presented to them on the side of the screens. This was, uh, these were information modules that we had created before the session. We also gave them the ability to add questions that they had via post-it notes. As you can see, participants were able to pull in the post-it notes from the bottom of the screen quite easily. They could also add additional categories that were missing via post-it notes, and they could also write and draw on the information modules provided if they wanted to edit or change those things. Throughout the session, we asked them to think out loud and tell us why they were selecting those specific information modules. And quite quickly, we started seeing themes in the information they were pulling onto the screen. So for example, they added questions about processing taxes. Quite a few of them wanted to be able to compare the options by specific characteristics, like whether they needed to hire a developer or not. They also wanted to quite frequently see the payment methods upfront. So, Jumping into why we used FigJam for this specific research study. FigJam was ideal because it was a co-creation tool that, was, that didn't have a steep learning curve. In the past, explaining the co-creation tool would take up so much time of the research session, and it left very little time for the most important part, asking the participant why they had selected those specific modules of information. In participatory design, the why is so much more important than the what. So that was less than ideal. We also saw that throughout the exercise, participants were more engaged and they had a sense of ownership over the work. So they, they were much more candid in the feedback that they gave and much more detailed. And this led to richer insights. 
We also saw that most participants mentioned that the, the exercise was fun and they could spend so much more time doing it. We noticed that there was less fatigue at the end of the session and so much more excitement. So moving on to the next participatory design exercise, this one was focused on the documentation. We wanted to make sure that users like Beth, once they had decided to use payment links, they were able to easily implement it using our documentation. So we used the thumbs up, thumbs down question mark technique uh, with stamps in FigJam. And participants were able to use the stamps to annotate the prototype in the document. So a participant marks sections that they find useful with a thumbs up, marks parts that they have questions about with a question mark stamp, and parts they don't find important with a thumbs down. And if they really like a section, they can even put a heart stamp. So for example, participants could have appreciated seeing the image of the implemented payment links at the start, as that would give them a good idea of if payment links were the right choice for their business. So they could have possibly annotated that with a heart. They could annotate the parts about the payment methods and languages with thumbs up, as that would be helpful in making business decisions. Um, but at the same time, they could be confused about creating payment links programmatically, so they can mark that with a question mark. So why did we use FigJam for this spe specific research? Well, it was easy for participants to learn about and then use the stamps. Uh, they were readily available at the bottom of the screen and participants didn't need a lot of instruction on how to use them. It also allowed them to read through the doc as they would in their natural setting. And we didn't need to interrupt their thought process to ask them to think out loud when they were reading the document. After they were done with annotating the document, we were able to follow up and have detailed discussions about the annotations and that helped us uncover rich insights. I've also had success using this for unmoderated studies. With very little instruction, I can send out a document through user testing and get feedback from multiple participants in a span of a few hours using FigJam. So now I'll pass it off to Yi Yi to, to talk about the next step of the research journey. Thanks, Azalea. Now that we know payment links is a plausible solution for users, we need to evaluate this solution. As this is a new way of getting paid for merchants like Beth, we are also introducing a new experience to Beth's customer. So in this phase of research, we need to evaluate how well payment links meet our users' needs, how is the experience for our users and customers, what works well, and what should we improve? You may think, I get it. It's usability testing. We've done this forever. What's new? It's true. In a typical concept testing or usability testing, the researcher moderates the study while the participants complete the tasks with the prototype. The observers on the call take notes in a Google Doc or different tabs over a spreadsheet or people like me using pen and paper. After the session, the researcher needs to consolidate notes from different people. And after all the sessions, the researcher needs to tie the findings and notes back to the prototype. And sometimes we'll hear people say, the participant said X, which part of the design were they talking about? And we went back to the recording to find it. This can take a lot of time. FigJam can be a great solution for those challenges. So next, I'm going to show an example of taking notes in FigJam for evaluative study. In this fictional scenario, we're evaluating the payment link experience with Beth's follower. He wants to purchase a handmade chess set from her after seeing the latest Instagram post. My teammate Mitchell, who I learned this technique from, will be taking notes. Heads up, the video has the view from both the participant and note taker and is sped up, so it will feel very fast. Let's watch the video now. So on the left side of the screen, the participant is doing the task in the prototype. And then in the main screen, Mitchell is taking notes in the fig jam. And as he is seeing what participants like, said, and um, did, he is noting in the exactly same area in the prototype and adding hearts when it's something delightful. In the payment methods part, the, quest, uh, the participant had a question and Mitchell noted that too. We're towards the end of this very short workflow. The participant was surprised by the confirmation screen. Um, the Mitchell, Mitchell wrote it down and then summarized overall 
what went well for this um, workflow? And what are some of the pain points and gaps? The video was very fast. So let's slow down a little bit. Uh, how did we do this? So the setup is actually very easy. First, we add the key states and screens in FigJam. We don't need to have all the states in, just the critical ones. And then we sign a different color sticky to each participant. We'll be leaving notes of all sessions in the same FigJam prototype and assigning different colors help us track behaviors and reactions from each session. And during the session, all the observers can leave notes like what we just saw in the video and even adding stamps like plus one to each other's notes. Here are a few tips from trial and error to run the sessions effectively. First, try to make the workflow short. Five, six screens will be easier for your observers to follow and take notes than a very long workflow. If you have a workflow, let's say 20 states, consider breaking them down. The section feature in FigJam is a very great tool to organize the workflows and stickies. As shown in the screen, we broke down a complex workflow to three sub workflows. And after the session, take a couple of minutes to organize the stickies as we want to make space for the next session. We'll have all the stickies across the session in the same prototype, so we wanna make sure there's space for notes in the next session. Uh, the FigJam board is also a really great place to show preliminary insights and do meet research debrief with the team. The team can walk the digital wall together, have a discussion around patterns we have observed, pain points, opportunities, and open questions. And we document all of those inputs in the same board. As the research moves along, the FigJam wall can become a living and breathing artifact for your team as well. So to summarize some benefits of using FigJam for evaluative studies for your team, First, it simplifies analysis and synthesis for researchers. It cuts the step of consolidating notes from different places. It just saves so much time. It also makes note-taking a more collaborative activity. The team can see each other's notes in the prototype during the session and after the session, and it reduces the burden of note-taking from just one person. The stems and emote in FigJam also add more fun in research sessions. Not only for participants, as Azalea just described, it also adds fun for your team. It makes staring at Zoom for 45 minutes a little more engaging. Last but not least, the FigJam wall helps bring the team and stakeholders along the research journey from research sessions, debriefs, data analysis, and discussion about next steps. So we've gone through several examples illustrating how you could use FigJam throughout the research process, from identifying opportunities to developing concepts and then evaluating those concepts. So next time you're planning research, think about ways you can visually represent ideas you want to learn about, so you can remind participants about the focus areas and give them something to react to. Remember, this doesn't need to be a prototype. It could be a visual representation of their journey, or it could even be a storyboard. Remember to also leverage the various interactive elements to make the session more fun. Give participants a sense of ownership and agency that will yield richer insights. Also remember to bring the team along. Think of different ways to surface insights during the session, ways to analyze the insights, and even brainstorm solutions together. We've just scratched the surface with the examples we've given. With more research happening remotely, it's imperative that we adapt and enhance our research methods and take advantage of the affordances and capabilities of tools like FigJam. There are so many ways that you could be using FigJam to enrich your research and unleash creativity. Thank you so much for joining us today. We don't have any chess bots to sell, but feel free to message us with any questions on what we talked about today. We are always up for brainstorming different ways to use FitJam for interactive and engaging UX research. Thank you.